Um, Alan, will you say a prayer for us, please? Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for another day that you've given us to live on this earth. Thank you for the life that you've given us and the way you take care of us every day. Help us to realize that everything comes from you and to be content with what you give us and to use what you give us to your glory. Thank you for the word that you've given us and the opportunity we had tonight to study it. Help us to understand what we study and be able to apply it to our lives. Help us to tell others about you and about the good news of Jesus and what he does for us and the salvation that he offers. Thank you for everything. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, tonight we're going to look at Judges chapter 17 through 21. And these chapters basically form a unit, a fairly cohesive unit. And they serve as an epilogue to the book of Judges, right? How would, how would you just describe in, in one sentence the book of Judges? Is it a, is it a um, uplifting, positive book? Is toilet bowl one of them? <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is a book that just presents a downward spiral to me, Israel and their spirituality. And that's really what you see in these last five chapters of the book. You really see how bad things have become in Israel. Um, what's unique about these five chapters compared to the rest of the book? What? No judges. no judges, okay? There's no judges. There is no formula that Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. There's no, you know, the, the repentance, the crying out, and God raising up a judge. There's none of that, okay? And what we have here, we have a couple of incidents, um, one in 17, 18, and then, of course, the Levites concubine towards the end of the book. And... Um, it, it just talks about how bad things have gotten. And really, do these chapters, are they chronological? Most likely not. They're like an epilogue. They're set, and this is what happened during the time of the judges. Okay? And we don't know exactly when these things happened. We know that uh, the incident with uh, Israel going to war against Benjamin most likely took place early on in the history of the judges. Because who's the high priest at that time? Anybody catch that? Phineas is the high priest. And so that means it's not long after they've entered into the promised land that this actually takes place. Um, no chronological order, incidents that took place during the period of the judges. And what they do is they continue to show the declining spiritual state of the nation. We noticed last week, when you talk about the judges, right, we start off with Othniel, and how would you describe Othniel? <coughs> Upright, noble character, okay. Who we end up with? Well, Samson in the book of Judges. You end up with Samson, and how are you gonna describe Samson? A mess, right? He, he's just a mess, okay? And, um, but God uses him. It says he judged Israel for 20 years, and he began to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And as we noticed last uh, week, that really didn't come about until much later in the reign of David, okay? Um, remember Goliath? Who was Goliath? He was this uncircumcised Philistine, okay? And that began David's ascension, and that began the demise of the Philistines as well. Um, so here we've got this declining spiritual state of the nation. And did anybody pick up on the key phrase of this section in these five chapters? It's mentioned four times. Yeah, there's no king in Israel. Everyone if, did what was right in his own eyes. Yeah, that's right. If you look at chapter 17 of verse 6, says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 
In 18, at verse 1, in those days there was no king in Israel. In 19, at verse 1, and it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. And then, of course, the last verse of the entire book. In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So, what, is, what does this tell us? What does the book of Judges tell us about I almost hate to, to use this phrase, but what does it tell us about human nature? What does the book of Judges tell us about humanity and the needs of humanity? They need, they need a good leader. They need what? a good leader. Yeah, we need, we need leadership. Okay, yeah. People need leadership, yes. When people do what's right in their own eyes, they end up with their own Yeah. Yeah, when people do what's right in their own eyes, you know, it is not a man who walks to do what? Direct his own steps. And we, we just make, we'll make a mess every single time. And it doesn't matter how well-intentioned we are. You know, how many, what's, what's the phrase? The way to hell is paved with what? Good intentions, right? We, we set out to do something, this is right, this is right, this is right. Um, we become wise in our own eyes, in our own sight, and we end up making a mess. And we find this in the book of Judges over and over again on the national scale. So if you were to look at the book of Judges, what's the purpose of the book? Do you, do you, do you see any kind of overall lesson or purpose that God is trying to teach us through the preservation of this history? Monty? Just generally, if you follow God, you'll take care of it. Yeah, yeah, that's a very general statement. Look, you follow God, everything's going to go good, right? You wander away from God, things are going to go south. Is that an absolute truth? No, it's not. Okay, and clearly it's not. But there is a general principle that runs through the scriptures that if we follow God and we walk in his light and we walk according to his ways, generally things are going to go good for his people. When we completely abandon God, does that mean that our whole life is going to end up being a mess here? No. Not necessarily, right? You see, I mean, all you got to do is read the 73rd Psalm. And the writer of that Psalm, Asaph, he is incredibly perplexed at the apparent ease with which the ungodly live. And, and he's thinking, I've washed my hands in vain. You know, I've cleansed myself in vain. But then he says, then I went in to the temple of the Lord, and then I understood their end, right? He has set them in slippery places. So the idea is that here in the book of Judges, generally speaking, when we follow God, things are going to go well. When we don't, things are not. And that may not always manifest itself in this life, but it will surely manifest itself in eternity. Was the covenant Yeah. That's exactly right. And I think what he's doing through the nation of Israel is he is trying to illustrate uh, the consequences of eternity. You know, period. There's his kingdom. And that is that is our our situation. If we mind God, if we are mindful of him, if we do his will, our ultimate end is going to be perfection. He's going to take care of us. Right? Shirley was talking to me. The other day we were out driving around running some errands, and it was just an incredibly beautiful day. I mean, it was almost as nice as Arizona. <laughs> it was... I was telling you people, I miss the West, right? And I was telling Shirley, I said, those clouds are almost as good as Arizona clouds. And it was just wonderful. And then Shirley made the point, you know, it, it, it's real easy for us as we go through life, to go through life window shopping. You know what I mean by that? You, you're in a perfectly comfortable house. You've got everything you need. But then you drive by that 20 acre estate and you see that big, incredibly gorgeous house off in the distance with the oak tree lined lane leading up to it. You think, Wow, wouldn't that be fantastic, you know? And uh, you see the person, you know, drive by in the newest version of the Corvette, you think, oh, that'd be wonderful. And Shirley just says, just think 
how awesome heaven's going to be. Because it will surpass anything we can even imagine here, right? No matter how wonderful something seems here, just think about how heaven's going to be. And so, you know, we go through life. Um, <laughs> As we go through life, um, the, the Craig Bradley Comedy Hour. As we go through life, you know, the general principle is you you walk after God, you follow Him in His ways, and you're going to end up all right. And um, I think that's one of the, the the major lessons as money points out here. All right. Yeah. I just have a question for your opinion. Do you think this phrase, there was no king in Israel, is suggesting that things could be better with a king, or maybe were better? When the, I don't know when this was written exactly. Okay. Um, they're, they're talking about there was no king in Israel, okay? And when Israel finally asked for a king, what did God tell Samuel? That wasn't his plan, right? God was supposed to be king. That king, that's right. Okay, so they had no authority, they had no temporal authority, but they had no spiritual authority. There was, there was no king, okay? And so we can say, well, who is your king, right? And it's God, he's supposed to be our king. And when he is, um, we're gonna be well taken care of and well provided for. God warned Israel a number of times already, here's the behavior of a king. You know, the day is coming when you're gonna want a king, and here's what he's gonna do, right? And then you'll probably wish that I was your king. Like, do you think Israel was happy for those 40 years that Saul was king? Probably not. Okay. Um, David, a little bit better. Solomon, a little bit better. But then what happened under Solomon's reign? When we look at those three kings, one of the things that I notice about them is that how would you describe Saul? God's going to make Saul their king. How do you describe Saul? And I think God is teaching Israel a lesson through all three of these men. How would you describe Saul physically? Well, physically, he was head and shoulders above everybody else. He was tall. He was good looking. He was handsome. He was strong. He was the perfect picture of a king, somebody who was going to be our leader. And he was a miserable failure. Okay. Then we've got David. And from a spiritual standpoint, we describe David as a man after God's own heart, right? So here's a very spiritually minded man. Yet, David was ultimately a failure in many, many ways. He was a failure as a father. He ended up in a lot of ways being a failure as a king, okay? So you can take the most spiritually minded man, a man after God's own heart, and he can't replace God. And then, of course, Solomon, how do we describe Solomon? the wisest man who ever lived. And he was perhaps a bigger failure than the two before him for his weaknesses. Just because he's wise doesn't mean he's not weak. Just because he's wise doesn't mean he's strong. Just because he's wise doesn't mean he is sometimes very foolish. And Solomon certainly was. And he led the whole nation into idolatry. And so God, they asked for a king. God says, all right, I'll give you three. And I'm going to teach you something with these three kings. Okay. And he did. And then, of course, the monarchy just goes completely south after Solomon. Okay. But before we get to that, they had come to this point in Judges where life has just got to be unbearable. What's the book after Judges? Ruth, right? And it takes place during the period of Judges. And it's almost as if you could take Ruth, remove the name Ruth, and put Judges chapter 22, 23, 24, because it again is showing, it's part of the epilogue, but something of course comes great out of Ruth, right? So now let's go back to chapter 17. Chapter 17 and 18, all right? List as many things as you can from these two chapters that indicate the corruption of Israel's thinking at this time. How does chapter 17 start out? Make a golden, uh, make an image, make a golden image. Stealing. Okay, but before that. Stealing from your mother. Yeah, this guy had stolen from his mother. 
right? She doesn't know that, so she pronounced a curse on whoever, you know, has stolen from him. Apparently, he hears it. He says, uh, uh, mom, <laughs> you know, I, here, here's the money I, I, I borrowed from you, I took from you. Um, and uh, perhaps he's afraid of that curse. He said to his mother, the 11, this is verse 2, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you, on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, here is the silver with me. I took it. And his mother said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my son. Okay. He stole it. Now he's giving it back. So it's like, may you be blessed by the Lord. Some people think she's trying to counteract the curse you know, that she had placed on the money. So he gives it back. What was her intention to do with it all along? Make a molded image. You know, make some household gods. Um, in verse 3, so when she had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, or when he had, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. So she's still worshiping God, right? May be blessed by the Lord, my son. Yeah, yeah. In her mind, she is, right? She says, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord. If you drop down uh, at verse 13, what does Micah say to himself after he finds the Levite to be his priest? All good. He says, I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as a priest. Okay. What, is, what does this indicate to you about the state of religion, at least in the mind of these two individuals? It's like it is today. People want to serve God, but they want to serve their own way. It's just not true to their standards. Okay, we've got that aspect of it. What, what about that statement in verse 13 there, where he says, Now I know the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as priest. Just on the basis of, of things that they have or their circumstances. So it's a, a very physical, outward conclusion. Mm -hmm. But like you say, that's not, not a good indicator. God's on your side. Right. It, it's almost it's like he's saying, hey, I, I've got God over a barrel now. You know, he'll be good to me now because I got a Levite as a priest. And so not much difference between that and then the simple paganism. If I offer enough sacrifices to Baal, he's going to cause it to rain. Or if I offer enough sacrifice to Asherah, you know, she's going to produce in my crops or my livestock. And it, it's almost as they're using God to get what they want out of it, right? They're not really serving the Lord here. So he returns it. She makes a carved and molded image to worship. And uh, it says there that Micah has a shrine. Go ahead, Vicki. This may be a ticky little thing, but they started out with 1,100 shekels, right? Uh -huh. And she said, I wholly dedicated that to the Lord for an image. Well, then when he gives it back to her, she only takes 200. Yeah. Image. And I thought, okay, what did she do with the other 900 that exactly. was wholly dedicated? Yeah. I kind of wondered if she wasn't going back on what she originally intended and she only yeah. gave the Lord uh -huh. 200 out of the yeah. I came across that too, and some people wonder if the 200 was to pay the artisan, and then the 900 is what the image was made out of. That was just a supposition on their part. But um, you don't know. Another person thought it was kind of interesting. When Delilah was bribed, how much was she bribed with? 1,100 shekels from each of the five uh, princes of the Philistines. Um, so. Verse 6 here, uh, in context, I think it's just explanatory. I think it's God's way or the writer's way of putting it in there. There's no king in Israel. Everybody did that which is right in their own eyes. That's what's going on here. So then, who does Micah initially make his priest? His son. One of his sons. And so it says he consecrates his son. What does it mean to consecrate? To separate to set apart, to separate. Like, okay, you're going, and the whole idea of a priesthood, even the Aaronic priesthood, you're going to be holy to God for me, right? It's almost, uh, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It just went blank. You know, um, you, you get somebody to do something for you. Vicarious. Yeah, holiness. yeah. Vicarious holiness. You know, like somebody else is going to do that for me. And so he sets his son apart to do that. And what's the idea of this ephod and this teraphim? Okay. Uh, Gideon made an ephod as well. Right? What's, what's the point of the ephod? What are they doing here? It says here in verse, um, verse 5, the man Micah had a shrine and made an ephod and household idols. And he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. What's an ephod? Yeah, it's kind of like the breastplate. It's, it's the priestly garment that you would wear. And then they would use the ephod or stones or whatever they'd put in it to kind of discern the will of the Lord, just like they did in Aaron, the high priest ephod. They had the Urim and the Thummim in there. And um, that might have been just the garment for the priest that his priest was going to, going to wear. And then household idols as well. Um, so what you've got here is you've got an incredibly corrupt form of worship for the Lord. I want you to notice something here about verse 10. This, uh, this Levite, he's on his way from Bethlehem and Judah. It looks like he's going up to uh, Ephraim somewhere. It says, Micah said to him, dwell with me and be a father and a priest to me. And I will give you 10 shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes and your sustenance. So the Levite went in. You know, so it's like, sorry, son, you're out. I got me a Levite now, okay? And so the Levite comes in, be a priest or be a father and a priest to me. What does it mean by be a father to me? What, what do they call priest, father in the Catholic religion? Anita, do you have any idea? It's supposed to be our... Uh... Like our spiritual guide, you know, our spiritual authority. You know, he's going to tell us how many Hail Marys we need to say and our fathers and so forth. And the idea is be a father to me, be authority figure for me. You're going to stand between me and God. Yeah, yeah, there you go. The idea, one, you can turn to for, for wisdom. And so that idea, that thinking, really doesn't have a whole lot to do with age. You know, it would have to do with supposed connection or wisdom, if you will. But on the flip side, then our father was supposed to give them full obedience and respect for those both ways. Mm -hmm. And they are authority over us, and we give them full authority and respect. Yeah. Okay. All right, Gary. This, this chapter makes me so sad because you don't have any good guys. Right, Micah is first thief, <laughs> and then he and his mother and the guy that she pays, they're all idolaters. Mm -hmm. And then here comes the Levite, and he, what should he have said? Yeah. Wait, no, you don't buy me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've got the Lord sustaining me in this other way, and I'm supposed to be a priest to everybody. Right. And no, he's complicit with this whole arrangement. And so, so the Levi's kind of, yeah, Levi's kind of a mercenary, right? He's going in there. And uh, it, it's, it, he doesn't object to the ephod. He doesn't object to the household idols. He certainly doesn't object to the 10 pieces of silver a year, or the change of clothes, or the sustenance. He's thinking, hey, I've just landed in a cushy spot. Okay? And we're going to see that mercenary nature come out in the next chapter here. All right? So what happens in chapter 18? Again, we have another chapter with no good guys. In chapter 18, um, again, we begin with an explanation of what we're going to be reading. There's no king in Israel. So in chapter 18, part of the tribe of Dan migrates north to seek more land. Back over in Joshua chapter 19, beginning of verse 40, it talked about how theirs wasn't big enough for them, but they later went up to the north to Laash, okay, and they conquered that territory, and that's what's going to happen here. So they're on their way up, and they send five scouts, and those five scouts go up, and they encounter Micah's priest. They come across Micah's household, 
they see the priest there and they start kind of questioning him about what's going on. And um, they ask him for a blessing. In fact, it says here, uh, on verse 4, he explains to them, Thus and so Micah did for me, he has hired me, and I become his priest. So they said to him, Please inquire of God that we may know whether the journey on which we go will be prosperous. And the priest said to them, Go in peace. May the presence of the Lord be with you on your way. So they go. Okay. So now we kind of take a break from from Mike and his household. And uh, what do they find? It says in verse 7, they departed and went to Lash. They saw the people who were there. Now they dwelt safely in the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and secure. There were no rulers in the land who might put them to shame for anything. They were far from the Sidonians and they had no ties with anyone. How, what's your impression of these people? the description that's being given. When the spies bring back the report, um, they basically say the same thing. Verse 10, when you go, you will come to a secure people in a large land where God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is on the earth. Now I know that the Israelites were to ultimately drive out the Canaanites and everybody. But I'm telling you, in this chapter, the description of these people, it just makes them sound like they're just innocent people, minding their own business. Nobody's bothering them. They're just living peacefully. You know, nobody, there's no kings, there's no rulers to oppose uh, these people from Dan or to cause any kind of problems. And uh, Dan goes up, slaughters them all, basically. But on the way, they come across Micah's house again. Okay? It says 600 men, all their, their livestock, all of their wives, and all their children are up there too. Um, verse 16 says 600 men armed with their weapons of war who were the children of Dan stood by the entrance of the gate. Let's back up to verse 14. Then the five men who had gone to spy out the country of Lash answered and said to their brethren, do you know if there are in these houses an ephod, household idols, a carved image, and a molded image? Now, therefore, consider what you should do. What should they have done? What they should have done was destroyed those things. Okay? But these five spies, think about this, right? Here we are. Here's Micah, all alone, no defense. So they turned aside there and came to the house of the young Levite man, that is to the house of Micah, and greeted him. Verse 17, Then the five men who had gone and spied out the land went up. Entering there, they took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image. And the priest stood at the entrance of the gate with the 600 men who were armed with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the graven image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? And they said to him, Be quiet. Put your hand over your mouth and come with us. Be a father and a priest to us. Is it better for you to be the priest to be a house, be a priest to the household of one man, or that you be a priest to the tribe and family in Israel? How did the priest react in verse twenty? Oh, his heart was glad. He just got a promotion, right? And uh, he took the ephod, the household idols, and the carved image, and took his place among the people. Then they turned and departed and put the little ones, the livestock, the goods in front of them. So there's that mercenary nature. No loyalty or anything. Like, oh, wow, I'm going to have a better income. I'm going to have more people subject to my counsel, my guidance. I'll be a father to a whole tribe in Israel, not just one man. And so you've got Dan here. And how are they going to worship the Lord? with an ephod, with molded images, with household idols. So they're no better than Micah, you know, at all. In fact, maybe a little bit worse. They're stealing his priests and his stuff, okay? So how does Micah react? You took my God. <laughs> yeah, ex <laughs> exactly. Verse 24, he said, you have taken away my gods which I made, and the priests, and you have gone away. Now what more do I have? How can you say to me, what ails you? And the children of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us. 
lest angry men fall upon you and you lose your life and the lives of your household. So basically, he's defenseless. He can't do anything, right? But how do you like that phrase? You have taken away my gods, right? Can anyone take your God away? No. No, not at all. And of course, that's one of the uh, problems with idols that nobody really wants to acknowledge, you know, throughout the Old Testament. I mean, they can fall flat on their face. They can have their hands cut off. They can be burned. You know, they can be stolen. They can be taken and put in other people's temples and what have you. But no one can take the Lord away. No one can take God away. And so it just, the, the thinking is so twisted here. So Dan goes up and they destroy the people of Laash. And uh, then in the verses 30 and 31, kind of interesting into this account, it says, Then the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Okay? This young man, he's a Levite, right? If he's a Levite, how can he be the grandson or a descendant from Manasseh? What does the ESV say there? Moses. Moses. Right? Children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the Gershonites, and the son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Of course, that's when the Assyrians came in and took them away captive. Um, between Moses and Manasseh in the original Hebrew, there's, there's some similarities there. So some translated uh, Manasseh, but uh, actual translations or literal translations translated as Moses. And you might have a footnote in your Bible about that. So they set up for themselves Micah's carved image, which he made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. Okay. All right. So there's the state. There's the spiritual state. Anita. No question. Uh, how come verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 1, says that Dan was not given the Take a look at Joshua chapter 19. In Joshua chapter 19, you know, Joshua is dividing up the land between these tribes here. When it comes to the land of Dan, it says in verse 40, the seventh lot came out for the tribe of the children of Dan, according to their families. And the territory of their inheritance was Zorah, Eshtol, Ir, Shemesh, uh, Shalibin, Aijalon, Jethla, Elon, Timna, Ekron, Elika, Gebethon, Baalath, Yehud, Bini, Barak, Gath, Remen. A lot of these are Philistine cities. Me, Jarkin, and Rakon of the region near Joppa. And the border of the children of Dan went beyond these, because the children of Dan went up to fight against Leshem, that's Laash, and took it. And they struck it with the edge of the sword, took possession of it, and dwelt in it. They called Leshem Dan after the name of Dan their father. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Dan according to their families, these cities with their villages. So at the time this account of Judges is being written, they hadn't yet done that. Right, so they're going up to do that. Okay. Um, in fact, in in the account of Judges early on in the book, it talks about the difficulty they have with their their land. In verse thirty four of Judges chapter one, it says, And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. So that's one of the reasons they're looking to expand. And that's why they sent these spies to the north. All right. Let's move on to chapter 19. This is perhaps one of, if not the most grisly chapters in the Bible. Okay. Again, note verse 1 which is explanatory. There's no king in Israel. Um, it's just talking about the state of affairs. So you got a Levite, another Levite. 
He takes a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. What's a concubine? A what? A substitute wife? Okay. A concubine doesn't enjoy all the rights and privileges of a wife, don't know that this man has a wife, but he is later going to refer to, refer to her as his slave girl. Okay, so concubines were considered property, even more so than a wife was in those days. So he had gotten this concubine, and um, after he takes her, uh, it says she plays the harlot and returns to her father's house. Now, that phrase, she plays the harlot, does not necessarily mean that she was unfaithful to the Levite. It doesn't necessarily mean that she had sexual relationships with another man. It just means that she refused to be his and went back home. Okay? And I can kind of imagine that. right? You're sold to someone, basically. You don't want to be with them. It's like, I'm going back home. Okay? And so, yeah, go ahead. The ESV uses the word unfaithful, and his concubine was unfaithful. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> if she if she doesn't stay with him, she's not being faithful to him, right? There's there's some question about the word in the original Hebrew that doesn't necessarily mean that she was actually sexually unfaithful to him. Okay, just means. She was unfaithful to him. I mean, if Shirley got up and left me, um, I think she'd be being unfaithful. Not necessarily having sex with anybody, but she's certainly not faithful to me and family. You know, she's doing that. We've we've attached meanings to words that don't necessarily always hold true. Um, and like I say, it's just the actual Hebrew language is rather ambiguous there. And I'm no Hebrew scholar by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. So she returns to her father's house. Um, what's the Levite do? Tries to win her back. He goes to win her back. Okay. After four months, the Levite goes to, to win her back. It says, um, verse 3, Then her husband arose and went after to speak kindly to her and bring her back, having a servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. Right? So she apparently is being wooed back to him. She brings him into her father's house. He's happy. Everybody's happy. Right? How long does Levi stay there? Three days. Ends up staying a total of about five days, four and a half, five days. On the fifth day, he finally gets out of there. I mean, they're eating, they're drinking, they're enjoying one another's company. The father keeps saying, hey, you don't need to take off, you don't need to go away. You know, maybe he doesn't want his father, his, his daughter, you know, to have to go away. Just, you know, stay here. And so finally, on the fifth day, the, the Levi says, no, I'm, I'm leaving. So he ends up leaving about midday. Okay, he takes his, his servant, his lad, as some versions call it, um, his concubine, his two donkeys, and he takes off and he starts heading home. It gets dark. What, did his, what does his servant suggest? Staying in Jerusalem. This is, I think this is an incredibly important part of this particular chapter, right? In verse 11, they were near Jebus, that is to say, and the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, Come, please, let us turn aside into this city to the Jebusites and lodge in it. And his master responds, okay, We will not turn aside here into a city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeah. Okay? The Jebus is Jerusalem. Remember, the Jebusites couldn't have been driven out there. Okay. So here they're, they're going along, days far spent. The, the Levite servant says, well, here's the city. Let's go in here and spend the night. And the master says, we're not going to spend the night among a bunch of foreigners. We'll go on a little bit further and spend the night among Israelites. What might be the thinking there? It'll be safer there. It'll be safer if we stay among our own people. Right? I don't want to stay up among these, these uncircumcised heathen here, these Jebusites. 
It's like, let's go up to Gibeah. So he goes up to Gibeah, and he gets a warm reception, right? Not at all. He's sitting in the town square, and how do people react to him? They don't. They ignore him. Nobody invites him in. Nobody's going to give him lodging or anything like that. It's starting to get dark. An old man comes in from the fields. He's sojourning in Gibeah. He's from northern Ephraim as well, the mountains of Ephraim. And uh, they get to talking. He asks the guy what he's doing. He says, I've got all the things I need, but you know nobody's invited me in. And the old man says, hey, I'll take care of your needs, right? You want to come in. You don't want to spend the night out here. Why not? It was like Sodom. <laughs> this old man kind of knows the character of the men of Gibeah, right? This is a parallel account to what? Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Some of the, the phrasing is almost identical. You know, the two angels, Lot says, you don't want to spend the night out here. You know, come on, come on in, right? And Lot knows what's going to go on, right? This old man knows what's going to go on. And so sure enough, you know, the sun sets, and then you get these men. Um, this is right here, verse 22. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men in the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him. New King James says, Know him carnally. They supply that word there. And that's the idea. Basically, they want to rape the man. Okay? And, uh, okay, that's pretty bad. But the next verse is even worse. I, I can't comprehend the next verse. The man, well, in verse 24, the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly, seeing this man is coming to my house. Do not commit this outrage. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. That word humble them, in the original Hebrew, that word is rape. He says, here's my virgin daughter, rape them and do with them as you please. But to this man, do not do such a vile thing. But the men would not heed him. Talk about without natural affection. Right? Now, culturally, I believe even to this day, if many cultures in the Mideast, if you're invited into someone's house, they're guaranteed your protection. Yeah, they could be, you could be their mortal enemy, but if they invite you into their house, no harm's gonna come to you in their house. Randy. But which one was invited into the home? Was it only the man and the woman just came as an extra plus one? Because she was also invited into the home and then mm -hmm. thrown out like a dog. Okay, this is the second thing, right? right? One, the man, is accorded this protection. She's a slave girl, right? And the lad is a slave. But also, she's property, and even, even the view of women, his own daughter, is not considered worth preserving her integrity. Well, I don't think it could, but I still don't understand why he would make such an effort to go pick her up, bring her back, and not have enough consideration and then what he ends up doing is just impulsive and it's like, okay, you've just spent over a week doing this and going through this terrible right. place to get home and right. now you just do what you do. Right. Maybe he's a coward. Okay. He's in a situation now where it's like, okay, his life is at risk. Yeah. Right? In fact, he's going to say later to the 12 tribes, these men intended to murder me, which is what happened to the concubine. But here he is, he's saying, uh-oh, you know, these guys want me. So he takes, you know, he basically, you know, takes over from the old man who's offering both the concubine and his daughter. He takes his concubine and just shoves her out the door, it sounds like. Okay? So all he's interested in doing is saving his own skin. You know, shove her out there, shut the door. And of course, they abuse her all night long to the point where she dies. Okay? You talk about this man and his character, how does she react the next morning? He doesn't even wait to see if she comes back. 
He opens the door. She's, she's laying, right, with her hands on the threshold, with her hands on her refuge. She should have never been pushed over that threshold. And he comes out. He sees her. Get up. Let's get going. He knows what's happened to her all night long. He doesn't think that she's dead, apparently, because otherwise he wouldn't have told her to get up. Let's get going. But he knows what she's been through. The thinking of these people. This Now, I know there's a lot of culture behind this. I know that there's a lot of uh, difference between male and females in their thinking in this culture back then. But this is how bad it has become in Israel. Because there's no authority. There's, there's no authority. Nobody's listening to God. General statement, obviously. You know, nobody's listening to God, and it's like, that's just the way they are, right? Um, blows my mind. Just blows my mind. So, he takes her, puts her on one of the donkeys, takes her home, gives her a decent burial, right? No, no. Butchers her. Limb from limb, 12 pieces, sends them throughout Israel. Says, Take note of what you might do about this. In verse 30, it says, So it was that all who saw it said, No such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak up. So what's the reaction of the rest of Israel? They're, they're shocked and they're outraged. They're outraged. How many of them show up to go put a beating on the men of Gibeah? It says 400,000 of them gather together at Mizpah. They gather together and they basically decide, all right, we only need 10% of this. You know, we're going to take one out of every 10, 10 out of every 100, 100 out of every 1,000. We're going to winnow this down and we're going to go in. So they just march in and they obliterate the Gibeonites, right? That's not what they do. They go to Gibeah and they say, look, you need to hand over the men who are guilty of this crime. They're acting pretty rational here. Now, and it, it, makes me, it makes me think that this has happened fairly early in the book of Judges because of their outrage, their shock. Phineas is still the high priest. Um, and uh, they say, look, just, just hand over the men who are going to do this. How does Benjamin react? Benjamin says, no way. We're not going to do it. And so they raise 26,000 men, and plus, I think, 600 more men of Gibeah. What was unique about these men of Gibeah? They were all left-handed, and they were all masters with a sling. They could sling a stone and hit a hair's breadth. And, of course, that gives a reason why they destroyed so many of the Israelites. Right? So um, the rest of Israel has no choice. So they immediately go up and... Wage war against Benjamin. Nope. What do they do first? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, the question I had was, why did they call him the Levi's husband of murdered woman? How is she murdered? She was murdered by her own husband, not by whoever yeah. perpetrated it. Yeah. So, which part are they avenging? The rape or the, this, you know, coming... He he's the victim. Right. She's not the victim. He's the victim. Right? That was his property. Okay? And look what they did to his property. I don't know that they're even thinking about her as being a woman. Just these vile men attacked this man to murder him and instead murdered his concubine or destroyed his property. And so he sends them out. This is how twisted things are. And I'm telling you, Brandy, I can't explain it any other way than that. I, I, like I say, it's a vile chapter, right? And so, yeah, they go up and they don't go right in. They ask the Lord. Another indication this might be pretty early in. All right, next week we'll finish up Judges. We'll uh, start taking a look at Ruth, the circumstances behind that.
Good evening. It's good to see everybody here tonight. We have a few guests here, and we're certainly glad that you were able to come our way for a period of Bible study. Certainly encouraging to us, and hopefully you've been encouraged as well. Look forward to every opportunity we get to get, come together, our next opportunity to come together to uh, encourage one another, to give glory and honor to God will be Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. Look forward to seeing everybody back at that time. I have a few announcements to make. Uh, Ken Blankenship has been exposed to COVID, so he's quarantining. Uh, Beth and Joe are both really tired and staying home tonight. Apparent Beth had gone to um, the funeral for her foster father this past week, uh, earlier this week, and so um, let's keep her in our prayers as well uh, as, with that loss. Um, Carrie and Jordan are back. Good to see y'all. They were in Florida. Austin is out of town, and Sarah's not feeling well, so that explains their absence as well. Um, I forgot to ask Greg. You, you still need help moving, or you got it squared away? You still need? Okay. And, uh, and then on Saturday morning, 8 o'clock, uh, Craig gonna need help moving. And what are we meeting first, your house or their house? Their house, 342 Bell at the spot, it's in the email. Okay, so it'll be at his parents' house uh, first at eight o'clock, so if you, can, if you don't have the email, uh, get with Craig and send it to you again. Just kidding. Uh, but what, seriously, uh, if, you, if you need to know where to go and all that stuff, he can get that to you. Uh, and the gospel meeting is October 20th through the 24th. Uh, Brent and Barry Kirchival will be holding a meeting there in Conway, Eastside Church. That's where Morgan preaches. So if you happen to be in the neighborhood or want to be in the neighborhood, then that'll be an opportunity for you to be with them. And that's all the announcement that I have. That's all that was given to me. So it's certainly good to see everybody. Let's remember who we belong to. Let's remember where we're going. And let's make sure that we're living our lives reflective of those two, two uh, truths. If there's anything else, we'll be dismissed with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our God, we're in awesome. 
you're an awesome God. We're mindful of how powerful you are. We see your hand in all of creation and, and wonder of the many complex things in life that you spoke into existence with your word. We're mindful of how much you love us, how much you've done for us, and how much you've sacrificed in our behalf. We're thankful for Jesus and his life that was given for us because of the sins that we've committed against you. Please forgive us of our sins. Help us to be mindful of the sacrifice that was made for us and live our lives following in Christ's footsteps. We pray that you'll be with our membership, those that are in difficult times right now, those that have lost loved ones. We pray for for Beth and Tara, pray for Jansen, Lori, and others that have lost for Diane and just the ones that we care about. Pray that you'll watch over them and help them to get through this difficult time. We need you in our lives. We know that you care for us. We pray for strength and wisdom direction to live our lives in a way that's pleasing to you. We pray for those that are going to be having surgeries, those that are having difficult times with health issues. Pray for Ken and Mary, for Dana, help Milt take care of her. And pray that you'll be with Greg with his up upcoming surgery. Pray that you'll be with Steve and his leg would heal Pray for others that need your help. We pray that you'll strengthen Debbie Alexi as she continues to care for her husband, Mike. Just pray that you'll encourage her and help us to be an encouragement to her. We pray that you'll be with us the rest of this week. Help us to be mindful that we need you each and every day. Help us to, to be mindful that we're here for a purpose, that our lives are before others. We realize that we need to be a shining light in all circumstances, in the good and the bad. Just pray that you'll help us to be the people that you want us to be. We're thankful for this time tonight that we can get together, that we were here to encourage one another and just pray that we'll be uplifted as we leave, that will give us the strength and endurance to keep going. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.